Hi, I'm Jessica Lewis. I host the Time to Wine broadcast, which is on Monday, the second, fourth Monday of the month. It is featured on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. I also started a live stream broadcast that is featured on YouTube, Facebook, Live, and Twitter. And this is on the first and third Fridays of the month at 11 a.m. So hit subscribe to hear more interviews here. And today I'm interviewing Ken Forrester, who's the director and CEO of Ken Forrester Wines in South Africa. In 1994, the first wines were produced under the Ken Forrester label. The award-winning wines were at the forefront of the Chenin Blanc revival, which we'd love to hear more about. So, Ken, can you tell us a little bit about your family history? Jessica, hi. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. And hi to, to everybody who managed to get onto one of your umpteen platforms. I, this, is, <laughs> this is pretty smart stuff. You're way ahead of me here. Family is, is, is a... It's a it's a simple tale. Um, Scottish background, four Scottish grandparents. Um, my on my maternal side, my mum's parents nearly destroyed the family because her father was from Glasgow, Glasgow, where shipbuilding was was the feature of the day, and her mother was a teacher at the Trinity College of Music in Edinburgh. And if ever there was an unequal society. Around about 1910, it would have been in Scotland, where if you came from Glasgow, you were not worthy of marrying a lassie from Edinburgh. There was no chance at all. And it was a decisive moment that after they married, they left the country because they were so scorned. And it took them to South Africa, where my grandfather was a foundryman in a gold mine. And during the Second World War, the we were South Africa was part of the British Commonwealth, and Britain had run out of capacity for building and creating armaments. And they commandeered all of the foundries at the gold mines, the smelters, the gold smelters, and they put the, their people in there to produce cannon shells and artillery shells out of brass. Uh, my grandfather was a foundryman who delighted in coming home with the, the ch chunks of brass after the war, all of the reject casings that had been badly molded. And they were used as ashtrays and knickknacks and umbrella stands, you, you name it. And it was just, it was a very, very simple beginning. I mean, as a, as a foundryman, um, they lived in a, in a house um, as I recall, it was a very neat and tidy little house, but it was made out of corrugated iron sheeting. It was a, a metal sheet house um, and thin, I mean, paper thin walls, freezing cold in the winter. Um, and that, that was that was their life. So, yeah, we come from Scottish stock right through. They say that the foresters come from between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Well, to be sure, they come from Edinburgh and Glasgow. I'm not so sure we were stuck in the middle. And, and that, that's about the size of it. I've traced our Forrester family history in Scotland, an illustrious clan, to say the least, um, protectors of the forest, protectors of the game. Um, I have an absolute passion for wildlife and for the game. And I have a, a, quite an active role in supporting rhino conservation in South Africa. I, I have a very soft spot for the rhino, which are being poached. It's just a terrible tragedy that, that's taking place here. And so, yeah, I mean, that's that's where we are. I studied hotel management and from hotel management, I guess, midlife crisis, age 35, as everyone does. I bought a winery. I just decided it was a good time to, to <laughs> buy a big chunk of land and start making wine, which is what I always wanted to do. <laughs> 30 years later, here we are. Well, it's so nice to hear that you follow your intuition and follow your heart about your your path. So let's talk a little bit. So I know that you are at the forefront of the Chenin Blanc revival in South Africa. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we got, <clears throat> I was a new kid on the block. Um, received a certain amount of scorn for that. And then started fermenting Chenin Blanc in 400 liter French oak barrels. Um, one of my colleagues was so skeptical. He said to me, so, you um you come from Johannesburg to the to the winelands. I said, Yeah, yeah, correct. And he was like, uh, 
you got a return ticket because if you carry on doing shit and luck in barrels, you're going to be using that return ticket pretty soon. <laughs> like, really? So fortunately, here I am, 35 years later, I didn't use that return ticket. And I started getting people together. I've always believed in collaboration. I've always been a firm believer in a rising tide raises all boats. And I started getting people together after harvest because I was absolutely curious to find out what they were doing and how they were doing it. And I would organize 10 or 12 people to bring their murky, cloudy, newly fermented Chenin Blanc around. And we would sit down together and taste these wines and debate them and discuss them to, to learn, predominantly for me to learn, because I'm a guy that hadn't been to wine school. I'd been to hotel school. It's not quite the same thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so here I was kind of <clears throat> poaching knowledge from, from them that knew. And we, we started to get together more regularly. And then a group of people started to decide we should formalize the Shannon Blanc Association. And we slowly kind of got that to go. And the Shannon Blanc Association probably has been responsible to a degree for a worldwide revival in Shannon Blanc, not just South Africa. Um, the, the Loire Valley has reawoken. Bear in mind that South Africa has nearly 60% of the world's Shannon Blanc vineyards. So the Loire has 30%. We have nearly 60. The rest of the world is 10%. You know, South Africa is the dominant player with twice as much vineyard, nearly twice as much vineyard as the Loire Valley. And with us making a noise about Chenin Blanc, the Loire Valley is woken up like, hold on, this is our cherished position as leaders in the field of Chenin Blanc. What are we going to do? So they've raised their game. We've raised our game. And I think the customers are going to get just the best quality Chenin Blancs they've ever seen. So, I mean, it's been a 20-year journey in just bringing Chenin Blanc to the fore. That's so wonderful. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about your winery and your award-winning wines? Sure. You know, it's a crazy, crazy thing. But when I came here, I had this, this kind of, people call it vision. I'm not sure it was a vision. It wasn't anything quite so dramatic. But, I mean, I wanted to make Chenin Blanc. There were people who were championing Sauvignon Blanc. They were championing a Chardonnay, Cabernet, Pinotage, Merlot. Nobody was championing Chenin Blanc. I wanted to be that champion. I, I saw a position vacant, and I thought, you know what, I could fill that. And literally, it was an opportunity to discover how the French were producing wonderful, wonderful wine from Chenin Blanc and why we weren't. What were we missing? How did we miss that moment? And the thought was to kind of get it going and set a benchmark and buck the trend. I'm always quite comfortable when all the sheep are coming towards me and I'm headed in the other direction. I like that feeling. It, it kind of makes me feel good. I understand that I'm not going where they all have been told to go by the group. I kind of like the opposite moment. So to champion Chenin Blanc wasn't difficult for me. Um, I believed in it. I loved it. I'd seen incredible drunk, incredible Chenin Blanc. Back to a memorable 1947 Chenin Blanc from Chateau de Fel. In, in the Loire Valley, um, in, in Tuarse, just outside of, of Angers, Chateau de Fel has the most insane 1947. I drank it on the estate, out of the cellar, this dusty old bottle, and it was a revelation to me. It was a revelation. It was the greatest white wine, possibly the greatest wine I've ever drunk. And I thought to myself, why can't we do this? Why shouldn't we be doing it? And we set about trying to do that, trying to make the best white wine in the world, unashamedly. I mean, what are we going to do? Yeah, let's aim for the top. Let's do the best we can. And it gave new life to Chenin Blanc. There were other people, enthusiasts like myself, who got on board, who chased Chenin Blanc. And we ended up producing quite a, a, a lovely, agreeable, delicious wine, very, very food friendly, um, works well with, with so many different foods. And Chenin Blanc also has a bit of a chameleon character. It camouflages itself. If you were to come into my home and say, I'd like a Pinot Grigio or a Sauvignon Blanc or an Albarino or a Chardonnay, 
and I gave you Chenin Blanc, you wouldn't be too unhappy. It would kind of cover those bases. You wouldn't be totally out of out of your depth. Shannon kind of fits across all those things. So it's a, it's this incredible, pliable, incredibly pliable wine. It produces grape. It produces wine in a sweet style, a dry style, in everything in between. Sparkling wine and noble late harvest. Older Chenin Blanc often has a kind of reminiscent nose of Riesling. You get that petroleum, that kind of benzene kind of character, that oily character on it. And that Chenin Blanc and Riesling share a great aunt about six generations ago. They're both related to a grape called Sauvignon. And I believe that that Sauvignon, which is still planted in France and still part of the French kind of um, work, what they produce, but Sauvignon, not Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon, and Shannon and Riesling all have some DNA that they share. So there is a connection with Riesling and Shannon Blanc. So this is a question. I want to. I just want to ask you this. With the revival, and there's 60 percent of the Shannon Blanc comes from South Africa. I, I have watched some of the marketing. Is there an overall brand for Chenin Blanc as in terms of, I know there's the hashtags and things like that that are going out for Chenin Blanc. How is Chenin Blanc being marketed worldwide? Um, <clears throat> interesting. We have an, an annual drink Chenin Blanc day, an annual drink Chenin day, um, we, which, which goes really big on, on all social media platforms. You'll see that right across from Twitter to Facebook to Insta. It, it's really the Drink Shannon Day, which takes place in June June each year, I believe, is a big event um, internationally. The Loire Valley last year held a Shannon Blanc conference in Angers. We are not last year, sorry, that was 2018, 19, before, before COVID. Last year was just a gap year, I guess. But we are planning in South Africa to host a Shannon Blanc convivium. We were looking to do it last year. We were looking to do it this year. We've now looked to push it out to about September 2022. Um, not knowing where the world is headed with the pandemic, that's what we're looking at. So there's international collaboration on Shannon Blanc. I mean, I've seen great Shannon Blancs from Canada, New Zealand, Milton in New Zealand. I mean, you've got a Canada, there's great Shannon Blanc. California, there's some great Shannon Blanc. Um, in France, obviously, you've got the home of Shannon Blanc, dating back to, um, I can't remember the order of the monks, but around about the, the 1000 AD, um, you've got Shannon Blanc in France re recorded for over a thousand years. It's only been in South Africa for 350 years. Um, people call us New World, and here we've been making wine for 350 years. It's not quite right. We, we do, we are a little older than we seem to be. We are like that. We also have very much of a French sensibility in our winemaking. There's a lot of French influence that came into South Africa initially. And so you see that a lot in our wines. But Chenin Blanc um, has, represents 18% of the South African vineyard. To put that into... Um, um, hectares, it's approximately 16,000 hectares, uh, about 35,000 acres of Shenan Blanc. So it is significant. It's significant, a huge chunk of plantings. Generally, it is used as a dry white wine. It's also used because of its great acidity in the production of spirit for brandy. And Shenan is highly sought after as a base wine for brandy. I make a Chenin Blanc in a sparkling wine style. I do it at a Metro Champenoise or a Cup Classic. We call it locally Cup Classic, which is a classic champagne method Chenin Blanc aged on lees for 27 months um, in the bottle um, before we degorge. So we have a Chenin from the, the driest, crispest, sparkling style right through the whole gamut of light, fruity, full, rich, barrel fermented to noble late harvest. We have a Shannon and a noble late harvest variant where that noble late harvest Shannon for me 
is the absolute essence of Shannon Blanc. Completely botrytized. The, the grapes are infected with botrytis, botrytis cinerea, this wonderful, wonderful mold that desiccates, dries all the, the fruit out completely, takes the water out of the grapes and leaves behind it the acid, the sugar, and all the flavor. It's almost in the kitchen when you reduce a 20 liter stock pot to two liters, that petit marmite that you've got, that absolutely rich, sticky demi glace, that's what the, a, a, a noble late harvest is. It's the essence of Chenin Blanc. I cannot wait to taste your wine. Okay. <laughs> so can you tell us, also I wanted to mention there was a gentleman that I recently interviewed that is in the United States in Missouri, and he went back, he found wine that existed, American wine, prior to prohibition in the United States. And a lot of this wine was killed by a virus. So yeah. he has found a book from the 1900s with a different, different types of wine varieties. And he went and found them and had and went and harvested these wines that were no longer in existence. And so he had no history of the taste. There was no history of, you know, he had no idea of what, what the taste would taste like. But he's done this and I need to introduce you to him. So he's I'd it's love, very to, love to meet him. Yeah. Yeah, so he's he's in Missouri and he has a museum. It's somewhat of a museum because he's revitalized uh, wines from the 1900s, and then he's created a museum at the same time. And he's with Vox Vineyards in Missouri, so I'll introduce you to him. Okay, so yes, I think you would like him. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about the region you're in? We're in. <clears throat> I'm based in a little region called Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch, to many, is the heart of the South African winelands. If you imagine Africa, South Africa, and the, the Cape province in the southernmost part of South Africa, if you imagine on that chin around the base of Africa, the smile above the chin, that's the Cape winelands. That area there, right on the coast, and two oceans. On the one side, we have the Indian Ocean, and on the other side, we have the cold Atlantic Ocean. So we have a warm current coming down the eastern side of the country. We have this frozen cold current, the Benguela Current, coming up from Antarctica at the bottom of the kind of the globe. And we have the welling of this warm and cold water, hence Sir Francis Drake's not notification that South Africa or Africa around the Cape was the Cabo Tormentosa, the Cape of Storms. And later on, later on, he renamed it, not him in fact, King Zhao of Portugal in 1400 and whatever. But King Zhao of Portugal was perhaps the very first marketing man. He deserves an honorary doctorate in marketing, I'm sure, because his sailors came home and said, hey, there is no way we're going back to that Cape place. Our boats got wrecked, blown away, blown into the rocks. That place is Cabo Tormentosa, the Cape of Storms. He was having such a tough time finding sailors who didn't believe the earth was flat. He needed people to get in a ship and head off. And if they thought the world was flat, they were going to die. They weren't going to sail anywhere. So he said to them, forget it. That is not Cabo Tormentosa. That is the Cabo de Bona Esperanza, the Cape of Good Hope. And to this day, that name has stuck. It is the Cape of Good Hope. And we are Stellenbosch, which is coastal on the ocean. Stellenbosch has five mountain ranges. Five mountains, like my hand, not one of them parallel to each other. All those mountains run in different directions. They offer different altitudes where you can plant vineyard up to approximately the mountains all peak out at about a thousand meters. 600 meters is about the level where we can plant up to, not much higher than 600 meters. And we're situated on the Helderberg mountain, which is nearest the ocean. We're approximately four miles from the Atlantic Ocean. We're right on a bay, a horseshoe-shaped bay called False Bay. Once again, King John, King Zhao of Portugal, 
his sailors of the day, probably on their blackberries or whatever, were sending each other a message saying, there's this great bay that you can harbor at when you get to the Cabo Buena Esperanza. There are two bays. One is on the Atlantic side and one is on the Indian Ocean side. And in the middle of winter, the bay on the Indian Ocean side is visited by a northwesterly wind which howls up to 50 or 60 miles an hour. You don't want to be there, but that's where they harbored. They were in the wrong bay. So they called it Baya Falsa, the false bay. And to this day, that, that horseshoe bay, approximately 40 miles wide and 40 miles deep, is False Bay, and it's a treacherous place for shipping. I and mean, so many people, friends of mine, have said to me, how come it's not so full of boats? I say, but it is. You just got to go down to the water to find them all. Oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is the water, I'm on the, I'm one hour away from the Pacific Ocean, so I'm on the right. other side of the world near the Pacific Ocean, and it's cold in this ocean. I'm a big fan of warm oceans. So is your ocean, is it a warm ocean, sunny bathing suit ocean? It, well, you're down, you're down, down that way, so yes. <laughs> so, so where we are, these two ocean currents meet. The Mozambique current flows down from India between Africa and Mozambique and down the east coast of Africa. And that current, when it gets to us, is about 18 degrees Celsius, about 65, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the current that comes up world on a, the Benguela current, which comes from Antarctica, comes up at about six degrees. Six degrees would be closer to about 16 degrees Fahrenheit, 16, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So you have this very cold current and this mildly tropical current meeting right here at the Cape. Gives rise to fog, gives rise to, you can imagine, hot water welling up to the surface, cold water going down below the hot water. So you have currents and eddies and really complicated ocean ocean work going on here. A lot of boats get into a lot of trouble. Okay, so, so we've got the region. So do, now I know you have had acquaintance with Nelson Mandela. You're a history-making man, and so is he. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I guess we were just very, very blessed at some stage of my life. Um, I was in Johannesburg and I was in a hotel in Johannesburg. And across the room, across the, the lobby, uh, was Nelson Mandela's daughter. And I went over to say hello. I, I, I knew her. And I went to say hi and say, like, oh, what you up to? What are you up to? Da, 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 da. And she said, well, we're actually here to organize Pops' birthday. Pops was her name for Mr. Mandela. Um, so I said, really? Great, man. What are you doing? She said, it's his 85th birthday. It's international television. We've got Sting. We've got Oprah Winfrey. We've got, we've got, we've got, I mean, you name them. They were there. The luminaries, the big players of the world. And I'm like, oh, that's going to be like, wow. And she said, yeah, and we're doing an event, but it's a hush, hush, private surprise party for pups the night before, the uh -huh. Friday night, just for close family, and very close friends. I said, that's amazing. So, you know, what are you guys doing about wine? She said, well, you know, we haven't thought about that. So I said, I got you. I can do the wine for you. Wine for the family, that little party. She said, oh, it's amazing. We're going to be about 180 people. I'm going, oh, sure. That's just a little party. <laughs> Great. She says, could I possibly invite you? Would you take a table? I'm like, are you kidding me? And I take a table. I said, sure. How big's your table? She says, oh, it'll be 10 guests. I said, I'm all over this. Like wine <laughs> on rice. I mean, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. How much wine did you say you needed? <laughs> oh, so we duly get to the event. I've got my, my chosen best friends in the whole world. And I'm sitting there. And they say to us, now, listen, folks. We're sitting in this conference room that has been decorated for tomorrow night's television, international, worldwide television broadcast. And in Africa, there's a wisdom that says, if you're to hold an important meeting, you should find an old tree that you can meet under the tree and allow the tree to impart some wisdom and knowledge into your meeting to help you, to guide you 
through the important agenda that you that you'll be doing and they'd created an ancient baobab tree baobab is known as the upside down tree it looks as though its roots are sticking out at the top because it doesn't have any or many leaves has a very small leaf and it's this massive massive trunk and with light they'd created with a little light bulbs they created this monstrous baobab tree in the middle of the room and taken the branches to every corner of the room to the outside walls of the room uh, all in little fairy lights it was the most beautiful decor and they said to us we're going to be sitting here in the dark when mr mandela comes in for heaven's sake don't jump up and scream and shout and clap the man's 85 years old we don't want an incident here just let him acknowledge you we'll bring the lights up and let him acknowledge that you're here before you scream and shout so we're like no problem we sit in there the doors open you see the silhouette, his wife himself and his daughter and another other daughter coming in. They come in the room, and as he comes in, he walks possibly 10 paces into the room, and they bring the lights up, and he looks around him, and he chuckles, but chuckles with almost, you can see him, he's kind of laughing, and he says in the, forgive my accent, he says in the Mandela voice, he says, oh, there's no fault like an old fault. And really, <laughs> today, I am an old fault. <laughs> People I'd love to meet, certainly. I have a list. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the perception of Chenin Blanc in the United States. It's easy. There's no perception of Chenin Blanc. <laughs> the United States missed that boat. They didn't go to Shannon 101. They missed that class. I don't know what happened. <laughs> the United States, come on. The United well, we need, States. We need to keep, we'll, we'll broadcast. We'll do a Shannon Block class and then we'll charge people to attend. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> dare, dare I say the United States has one white wine and one red wine, and that would be Chardonnay and Cabernet. And that's <laughs> about the size of it. You know, the market, the market would tell you different. There's another white wine called Pinot Grigio. Um, because that's the biggest selling white wine in the United States, from Italy, obviously, but the biggest selling white wine. Chenin Blanc, for years and years and years, the French never even called Chenin Blanc Chenin Blanc. If you were a wine aficionado, you were supposed to know that Chenin Blanc was Vouvray. You were supposed to know that Chenin Blanc was Chateau Anjou. You were supposed to know that Chenin Blanc was, was Sauvignon. You, you knew that stuff. You didn't have to be told it was Chenin Blanc. So, uh, sadly, not too much knowledge. And to make it worse, to compound the fracture, those wonderful carafes, those jugs that were produced in California with that rip-off tin lid, the Paul Masson Chablis, that was Chenin Blanc. That Paul Masson stuff that came in a, in a ga half-gallon jug, <laughs> you ripped the top off call. that thing, all right, that, that was all Chenin Blanc in the day. And... People were like, Chenin Blanc makes us, and we call it Chablis. So who was ever going to know it was Chenin Blanc? It's the most disguised grape in the world. It's never been revealed. And so we are on a mission to teach the United States about Chenin Blanc. You know, I, I think I might live to be 150. I'm not sure I'll get it done. <laughs> well, you know, there will be advances in medicine. We don't know what's going to happen with us with our, our age. <laughs> If Shannon Blanc was a cure for COVID, we'd be great. It would, it would sort everything out. Well, and so speaking of COVID and the worldwide pandemic, which none of us have been exposed to in our lives, let's talk about South Africa and the pandemic, COVID, and what's happened with the prohibition, which must you know, have been. Jessica, Jessica, I think that any person's perspective of COVID is my perspective, your perspective, and reality. And I'm not sure <laughs> we are anywhere close to anywhere. But, you know, COVID um, certainly has given everybody a time to think. And I think a lot of people are going to rethink their lives, are going to rethink how they do what they do as a result of COVID. I think it, it put the world into pause mode for <laughs> a time, which is fascinating and valuable. Um, I agree. That, yeah, yeah. Beyond that, it wrecked businesses. It destroyed livelihoods. Um, it destroyed life. Many people. 
Um, it, it brought heartbreak and tears. It's hard to find the upside, apart from the fact that hopefully with that time to pause, people have planned their lives differently. Today, I was talking to a medical doctor, a surgeon, a specialist surgeon, and I, he was around tasting wine with us in our tasting lounge. And I said to him, Doc, you know, Friday, you, you know, if you're not got a list, you're not busy. And he said to me, you know what? I just don't work Fridays. I've figured out I need me time. And I pack it in Monday through Thursday. Fridays, if I've got any admin, I can do my admin. But beyond that, I don't work Fridays because I don't need to have work. I, I'd happily just have that time off. And I think that's a direct impact to COVID. I think a lot of people have sat down and taken stock of their lives, taken stock of who they are, what they need, what they do, and said, you know what? It's a short life. We're not here for a long time. Best we're here for a good time. I agree. I think it's been somewhat of a, a, a in light of saying a spiritual shift to a certain degree of I'm an extrovert and I've been at home working. And so a lot of this, what I'm doing on social media is 40 or 50 hours a week of work. So I'm working on a business while I'm doing this. But it also gives us perspective of a larger world, how we can connect with others how we can make the world a better place. And yep. so I, I think some of what we're doing here is connecting one part of the world with the other part of the world and creating a more peaceful planet, even though it may not seem that way. And moving forward with a lot of, I, I think also making transitions to how we treat our planet um, has, has definitely been altered here. So, okay, here's another question. So I was working at a university and this is going to lead into your question. I was taking students to Europe on wine tours for about four years. I was encouraged to step outside of the university and work on that out here. Thus far, I've had another university i've actually had nine universities ask me if i could take students to a variety of places so the university of washington asked me if i could take students to south africa so come on down so and i i'm credentialed to actually teach as i'm a businesswoman but i can actually teach uh wide marketing and social media etc so if we were coming to south africa Let's talk a little bit about planning a trip to South Africa and what that would look like. It, I assume at some juncture we'll be able to travel again. Like I said, pack sunglasses. You're going to need some sunglasses. <laughs> we, get plenty, <laughs> we get plenty of sunshine. Um, uh, Weather-wise, we are a Mediterranean climate. Think of the south of France. Um, think of Provence, of the, of the Rhone Valley, the southern Rhone. That's our climate cold wet winters but winter for us beautifully beautifully balanced where you will have three or four blue sky days and a daily temperature in fahrenheit of around about 10 12 degrees um uh, sorry fahrenheit that's about 45 degrees um in celsius about 10 12. so it'll be 45 50 degrees um every single day and then after four glorious blue sky days, the weather turns foul. The sky goes gray and it rains for four days just to upset you. And it's the most wonderful soft patter of rain. It demands a fireplace and a crackling fire, a glass of wine, some good friends. And it's a great time to sit and cogitate and restore your faith in humanity and you have four more glorious blue sky days and that's winter and we come into spring and the rain will come and annoy us and then kind of just get in the way of the new vintage the new plantings and the new the new buds and then we head into summer by about november december 
our seasons are obviously switched around six months from your seasons in the Southern Hemisphere. So we head into a summertime in November, December, January, and by February, we head into harvest. And whilst harvest is a busy time, February, March, April are the very best months of the year. February, March, April, you've got the sunshine, you've got the heat, you've got the warmth. And you get past February into March and April, even May, for example, where we are at the moment. The most amazing weather, the most delightful. You could go out with a light coat or perhaps not even a, a coat. You just you could go out in shirt sleeves as I am today. Yeah, we are well into autumn, well into the fall, and I'm walking around in shirt sleeves. I mean, it's just, it's that kind of weather. Tomorrow we expect some rain, so winter's coming, winter's headed this way, but it's mild weather. It's long, dry summers and cold, wet winters, but no freezing. We might get snow every third year on the mountaintops and once every 10 years on the ground around us might get snow. It's not often, not often at all. It's really the most delightful weather, really cool weather. We have here, we have an intense rainy season. So there's a lot of introspective wine drinking, <laughs> tea drinking during that period. Uh, in the winter, in the summer, it's the most wonderful. It can be, it's wonderful, wonderful weather. So we keep our windows open and we don't use air conditioning generally. And it, unless sometimes it can reach 107 degrees, we generally have a lot of festivals and, and different activities, except when there's COVID, we stay at home. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do fun activities on our patio. <laughs> which is getting kind of uninteresting. Okay, so I wanted to ask you, so we're going to wrap up here. So I just wanted to mention again, so the Time to Wine broadcast is featured on a variety of different social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook Live, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And then I'll be adding an Instagram broadcast. So Please subscribe to our channel here. And then I wanted to ask, um, Ken, how do we find you on social media or how do people connect with you? Social media, we're on we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, um, we're on um, Instagram, and we're on Twitter. And so Ken Forrester Wines, um, KF Wines is the kind of handle, the hashtag Ken Forrester, um, KF Wines is kind of thing. Um, we kind of post i post a lot of the stuff on twitter um like every now and then i'll have a little rant about about how unhappy i am about something it'll upset me but generally i'm fairly even tempered about it. <laughs> i kind of try and try and keep it under control and no posts after 9 p.m you kind of don't do that anymore <laughs> Stay. no post after nine no politics no religion <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to stay away from anything that would uh, offend anyone. <laughs> so I just keep it is historical. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you and we'll keep discussing this um, headed to South Africa with busloads of students and see how that goes. And I appreciate you so much and I will talk to you soon. And we'll, Jessica, we'll be I want to be on a variety of different platforms. I want to be your tour operator. I'm going to put you in touch. I'm going to set you up for the trip of a lifetime. I promise okay. you, I'll exhaust you and your students. Give me a week. Give me 10 days. You guys are going to be happy to be headed out. You're going to be, thank God that's over. We're going to, we're going to run you ragged. It would be magic to have you out here. Absolutely magic. And I guarantee you a good time. And I've got witnesses. I promise you. I have people that will tell you that's for sure. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to end the broadcast now. Thank you so much. Night-night.